Thanks, Richard. Uh, great to be here. And this is our first shot at doing a uh, talk from the Mongolia trip, so hopefully it will go okay. Um, as Richard mentioned, it was a general general trip, but um, we tried to prepare as well as we could for what we were going to see, particularly along the way of uh, butterflies. And some of the materials are in the back uh, on the table there, so you're welcome to take a look at that. There's maps, there's uh, Mongolian stamps of butterflies, there's Mongolian stamps of grateful dead bears. Fairly um, <laughs> related. Um, and also some of my, my books, uh, some of my poetry books and a book that was done, a small chapbook that was done particularly for how we uh, discovered on this particular trip. And those are available if people are interested in uh, buying them and glad to sign them. Anyway, I thought we'd start out with a few a few maps to give us geographical and biological grounding as we get into this. Um, people often refer to Mongolia as sort of the egg on the back of the chicken, with the chicken being China below it and Russia above it. Um, use your imagination. Chicken head, chicken breast, chicken tail. And um, kissed to the west by Kazakhstan. The uh, large lake up here in Russia is Lake Baikal. And uh, that's where some of the people we've traveled with have been uh, working on nature um, interpretation. And one of the places we went, uh, which was Lake Hofskull, was in that Baikal drainage. Uh, also, you'll see where the North, North and South Korea are. And we came in by way of uh, Incheon Airport in Korea. Um, another map of Mongolia, and a few things just to point out. Uh, there's a series of mountain ranges, the Altai running from the far west clear down here to the south, and this far. Uh, the Gobi Desert is just to the north of this, and uh, Hustai, uh, sorry, Hangai mountain range in here, and the Kentai up in this area. <coughs> To sort of give you a sense of what the climate is like, I put together this slide. Um, and it's um, latitude wise, it runs from about where Laramie, Wyoming would be in the US to Saskatchewan to the north. It's inland, it's set back from the sea, so it doesn't have the moderation of the ocean climates. It's <coughs> quite cold in the winter, um, relatively warm in the summer depending on where you are. Um, so this, and it's about a fifth the size of the 48 states. Some habitat zones, again, to give you a sense of the range of habitats. Um, you have taiga to the north, up against, uh, that will go away, up against the uh, Russian border. And then as you move south, and you're getting lower, and you're getting drier as you go south. So you've got the forested steppe, the darker green, or the medium green, the unforested steppe, which is light green, and then you get into the, the Gobi, which is actually has, has sub-regions. You have the red Gobi and the yellow Gobi and the black Gobi. And here in the extreme south, the desert zone is pretty much uninhabitable. Oh, I was going to mention too, you're welcome to ask questions Question the material. I'll try and keep it moving along, but if people have got questions, feel free to, to shoot. So, Bill, what's the difference yes. between the desert and the desert stuff? Um, we, yeah. you know, we didn't get, we only got up to the edge of the desert per se, but what we saw were um, dunes, sand dunes, that sort of thing, which you don't see in the, uh, in the Gobi itself. The Gobi is flat, pretty much hard packed. In the northern part, wherever you drive, you're driving over onions, or wild <laughs> onions. And so you get out of the vehicle, and there's this odor of chives and onions in the air. It's amazing. In which area you're saying is like that? Uh, well, that's like the southern steppe and the northern Gobi. <clears throat> okay, I guess we've got that. Um, a quick 
sense of where we were in Mongolia. Um, so if you intended to mention this earlier, I'll mention it here now. Um, Mongolia has got about 3 million people in it. So fifth the size of the 48 states, 3 million people. That's like five people per square mile. And half of those people live in the capital, which is Ulaanbaatar, which is shortened. Everybody refers to it as UB, like we do to LA. Um, so 3 million people, 60 million herd animals. Particularly now, a lot of goats, because cashmere is hot, and they raise a lot of cashmere goats. So you've got goats, sheep, uh, cattle, horses, um, and, and camels are the primary. And then you've got that's right, yak cattle. <laughs> what a great name for an animal, yak. <laughs> anyway, um, so where we traveled, we came into Ulaanbaatar, came in from Korea, and trip out here to Huskai National Park, it was a day trip, then flew up here to the Lake Hofsko region, spent uh, five, six days there, came back, and then traveled by vehicle, we were in a caravan of land cruisers, uh, five, I think five land cruisers and a cook wagon following us and made this loop um, almost up to the Russian border then south, hooked back and then south into the uh, southern Gobi and then back north to Ulaanbaatar. Um, don't have too much to say about the wildlife in Korea, but um, piranhas seem to be all the rage. Uh, I think some have been released. I, I don't understand Korean. We watched for about an hour as they spoke to the scientists. I'm not sure exactly what was going on, but it seemed quirky. And that's worth reporting. You're saying how good they are to eat. <laughs> so they're an introduced species from South America? Uh, yes, and I think I've heard from other people that they're unlikely to live a full year there. It's too cold. That they would not survive a full year. So right. I think it may have been a, a short length lived in panic. They farm them? Yeah. In Korea? Or yeah, because they're good to eat. Are they? Yeah. No. Okay. Well, maybe I got it wrong. They're good to eat you. We're good to eat. It's sporting in your age. Okay, this is our Bible. And uh, I understand that Jonathan has uh, dealt with all of these folks, the authors who were all Russians. Um, I believe this was published in 2008, 2009. And it was it's a fairly expensive book, so I got it on an interlibrary loan, scanned it, or scanned most of it, put it in a three-ring binder, and took it with us, and that binder is back on the table, along with the other materials. And what it consists of, mostly a series of photographs, um, dorsal, ventral, um, multiple photographs for each species, and then these uh, the description, which is just a description of where they've been collected, and their best estimate of the range within Mongolia of that particular species. And all in English? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is, as a matter of fact. Uh, Jolt, Jolt, well, then, he's Czech. Oh, OK. Right, yeah, the Czechs have done a lot of stuff in Mongolia. So yeah, right. yeah, yeah. A lot of natural history. Yeah. Well, they used to be behind the Iron Curtain, so they had you know, a special relationship. Yes, and, and Mongolia was. Uh, communist for from about 1920 to 1990. So that, that, that's another intricacy to their history and what we were seeing. Quick thing about the faunal realms. Um, we're noticing, as everybody probably who's traveled in these areas notice, when you go to Europe or you go to spots in Asia, there's some strong similarities between the critters you're seeing, including butterflies, um, in Palearctic, the Arctic, together referred to as the whole Arctic. And I think you'll recognize some of those similarities um, as we proceed. And to sort of get a, a sense of that, this is a graphic I generated, pretty simplified, but using the, uh, the taxonomy that's in the uh, Butterflies of Mongolia book, primarily a list of families and subfamilies. Uh, and these are the sub families and subfamilies that you'll see in Mongolia or in Cascadia or in Washington. So ones in black <coughs> occur in both places. Those families and subfamilies are both in Mongolia and Cascadia. The ones in red are just in Mongolia. The 
the ones in green are just in Cascadia. So in this case, the metal marks and uh, the milkweed butterflies. So it gives you a sense that there's some pretty strong overlap on, a, on that higher level. And of course, the overlap becomes less as you get down into uh, genera and species. <coughs> so flying in from Korea to the capital, uh, sits down in a basin. It's got some of the worst air pollution in the world, particularly in the winter. Uh, heated by coal, that's what the stack is there. And, uh, and that, we were told that these ponds are sewage treatment ponds at the edge of the town. You also, in the lower figure here, see uh, these, the dots on the edge of the urban area. Well, those are gears. And gears are what the Mongolians call yurts. Yurts. Yurt is a Russian name. Gear is the Mongolian name of the same kind of structure. A lot of people have moved in from the countryside. And um, as things, well, as, as Umbatar has developed, and also as things have gotten tougher uh, to, to live outside um, the urbanization, a lot of families have moved in. Sometimes they move back. OK, so our first uh, day trip. Here, as I mentioned, the Hustai National Park, just a little bit west of Ulubatar. And um, this is a, a national park where the Taki or Przewalski's horse has been reintroduced. Uh, it was pretty much extirpated in Mongolia. There were a few collectors in um, Europe who had individuals, and those are what were the stock to bring. Um, the, this wild horse back to Mongolia. Uh, we stopped in the spring, and here it's interesting that we had Hayden's ring, ringlet being talked about tonight because mm -hmm. here's another Cianimpha. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I was telling John that the, the ones in quotes, those common names, I did that. <laughs> because I couldn't find any common names for them, and I figured things needed common names. So I put those on Flickr, and I'm, I think I'm going to check after a year and after two years and see if anybody out there is using these common names. <laughs> Probably not, but it's an experiment. So it's interesting that, that ring of, of, of islets on the uh, uh, dorsal or ventral hind wing is pretty much reminiscent of the Hayden's. And then we have uh, the blue here. Uh, it's a species, Polymatis, uh, Amanda's blue. That's not a genus that we've got here, but you'll notice how similar the critter looks to the blues that we do have here. Almost looks like a sepiolus on top. The uh, plants? The, the uh, demand is blue. Oh, really oh, oh yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, so the blue is paleoarctic in distribution. Larval plant is a species of vetch, and the larvae is ant-tended, as are certainly some of ours here. And the uh, Cianippus, of course, larvae feeds on, on grass, uh, primarily poa, uh, bluegrass. And I think both of them, well, okay, that, that species is found from the Urals to Korea. And the Amanda's blue, like I said, is pretty much throughout the Antarctic. These are the horses that showed up uh, while we were looking at butterflies. They just came to the spring.
So would this have been native to the area? Yes. Hmm. Yes. A another large critter there, the red deer, which is, if not the same species as our elk, are obviously uh, very closely related. Uh, you're referenced to them being the same species group, whatever exactly taxonomically that means. We like reindeer. Uh, <laughs> do you have reindeer there? Uh, they do. They ride reindeer there. Oh, cool. There's some great videos on uh, <coughs> available out there. The rangers uh, up in Mustai of, of the rangers going out in the winter riding on their reindeer to make sure there's no poaching and whatnot. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're um, set to travel by air up to Lake Hofstall. Primary reason we're going there. One of the primary reasons is the Nottingham Festival, um, where it, it happens throughout the country in various towns. Um, it celebrates the three manly sports. Anybody want to guess? What the wrestling three? is one of them. Wrestling is one. <coughs> Horse racing. Horse racing is two. Come on, only an experts here. And the third one. Eating their butt. Their <laughs> <laughs> butt is really good. Oh, no, it's really good, really good. <laughs> Much better than you. Archery. Oh. But archery sort of tailed off, um, and the wrestling and the horse racing. Huh. We got our first introduction to the vagaries of Mongolian travel. Uh, we sat in the airport for 12 hours waiting for the plane we were supposed to take. We never did hear what, why we had to delay. One theory was that some rich Mongolian had commandeered the plane for his own purposes. Anyway, so we got into Moran and drove to Lake Hostel in the dark. Video, a little sense of what the vehicle ahead of us looked like. <laughs> uh, Lake Hostel is one of the I guess, half dozen or dozen ancient lakes in the world. A uh, lake that's a, over a million years old. Outside of the capital, the places we stayed were in uh, yurt camps. So we stayed in the uh, yurts. This one had a wood stove inside. Uh, a young lady came in every day and lit the fire, got things warmed up. It was pretty chilly here, and at times it was raining pretty hard. The erosion here along the um, edge of Lake Costco I think is associated with power boats and that sort of thing, which are new to the area, and I don't think they're allowed, but as anywhere in the world, if you have rules but they aren't enforced, um, they aren't enforced and things fall apart. So I think that's what's going on here. Again, as I mentioned, the horse, very important to Mongolians, and we saw a lot of horse travel. Um, so here's a, a few uh, pictures from the from the Nada Festival. Uh, the wrestling in the upper hand, left hand corner, much like Greco Roman, really important. Uh, below that, some girls, one of them in traditional dress. A um, lot of shamanism still in Mongolia. It's dancers, uh, it's a dance troupe, but the dancer here is, uh, get up and moves, inspired by uh, shamans shamanistic practices. Uh, see some Europeans uh, in the crowd, but also plenty of Mongolians. The horse racing is mostly long distance, like 15, 20, 25 kilometers, and it's adolescents that are riding it, young, mostly young boys, so 10, 11, 12 years old. Is this where they, uh, they eat Amanita mushrooms? A little further north. But yeah, among the reindeer people, I think, particularly, but also the Finns. Uh, I'm not sure so much about Amadeus here. It's associated more with Finland in that area. Oh, no, no, a lot of central uh, Siberian tribes. Okay, but true. true. Yeah. So they eat Amadeus of Iscaria? Yeah. They do. And uh, I don't know if I want to mention they, uh, they save their urine mm -hmm. in pouches and then. They call their reindeer in, 
and the reindeer drink it and love it. It's a true story, but probably not unrelated, unrelated to butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the herders eat the mushrooms and then save the their urine. own urine. Yeah. So the animals get something out of that. Right, right. Well, actually, I heard another story, but hey. <laughs> I heard that it was recycled. <clears throat> yeah. Other people would drink it. Oh, that may be too. That may be too. Well, maybe, deer, that may be disgusting. <laughs> deer will go after our urine and just like the sheep and deer. Yeah, sure. deer also, so it's not so sheep. Really? Okay. But in addition, near this place where they were holding Naga, there were a fair number of butterflies. And, and the whole event and location reminded me of, not a little bit of like the Okanagan, perhaps, and uh, like Okanagan. Um, Barter fair, people having things out on their blankets and selling things, and um, it had that kind of a, a feel to it. Anyway, some of the butterflies, as we wandered around the edge of Nada that we uh, came across, is this uh, Fritillaria genus that we don't, I think, have in North America. Yeah, if you go to Meloria, do we have it? That's, that's just another name for Meloria. Oh, is it? Because some of the other ones we call Valoria, but this whole Yeah, that's because there's differences of opinion. Okay, because it doesn't look like. Yeah. Okay. So this is more or less um, a an endemic just found in the Baikal region. Uh, well, from the Baikal region to the Amur, so over towards the uh, Pacific Ocean and uh, host plant saxifrage. And then the, the chestnut heath down here, another um, symphonoma, symphonoma, so again related to our ring, but called uh, common name chestnut heath. And I believe that one's sort of all the way from Asia to, um, yeah, throughout temperate Eurasia. So does that imply that there is a chestnut species there? I think they're referring to the color. Oh, okay. Thank you. I think. Um, okay. So another polyomatis, this one common name, uh, Greenish Mountain Blue. Um, Eurasian. Host plants include Astralagus, um, milk vetch. And something called Oxytropus. Uh, Oxytropus is just another genus of milk patch. Okay. Okay. It uses both local weed. Echo here, sir. What is And don't know if you recognize this guy. Well, shouldn't the name there, but it's our northern blue. Yeah. It actually, looks kind of like our northern blue too. Cool. That must be a mistake. <laughs> and a, uh, a greater fritillary. And this one, according to uh, some the authors from the uh, Mongolia Butterfly book were quite helpful when I contacted them by email. And uh, according to this author, that was Arganis Zeki. I you can make that call from uh, just a dorsal view. That's Pretty impressive. Well, there's only a, you know, there's not many you know, Argenis in Mongolia. It's probably easier to do it for there than it would be in Europe. Mm. And a couple of other butterflies in that same general tribe. Um, this, I understand, the, the Mongolian checker spot in one of my names um, is the male. The male has this dark, orangey, uh, dorsal, and then an eventual uh, shot here. And also somewhat of an endemic uh, found in the Baikal drainage and, and nearby drainages. And the host plant, Veronica, Veronica cana, something called the pure silver, which uh, apparently is a domestic, it's been domesticated somewhere. Medicinal. 
And this one, we weren't able to nail it down. Perhaps it's the euphidrious, perhaps it's ambiguous. <laughs> scarce or ambiguous, or both. It's scarce and ambiguous. And here is uh, a Rivia, uh, the Colorado Alpine, which has a really interesting distribution. Uh, Aridia Callias in Colorado. Hmm. And then it's sort of hidden by this uh, drop down, but there's another subspecies up here in Siberia, and then four subspecies in the area where it's in. We're probably right about here, up into Russia, over into the Altai. No, it's just been discovered in the Ural Mountains. Um, I guess it has been that part of the West. And Apparently this uh, distribution is something on the order of maybe 15,000 years old. It could be older than that. Yeah. Well, the beef is also interesting in some plants as well. Really? Yeah. How's that? It's interesting in some plants from Central Asia to Colorado. Yeah. But oftentimes though, there's, there's a, an island in the middle of uh, Yukon of the same species as well. Oh, really? So it's, it's fairly recent. And some of these, these are uh, maybe like three or four interglacials old, so, you know, so we don't really, it could be a lot older than 15,000. Yeah, and I'm not sure whether they were infer how they were infer inferring that, um, whether perhaps from the genetics. Uh, yeah, the like molecular clocks are pretty, pretty iffy. Yeah. Yeah, right. So this is probably just a subset of the species that are out there, the ones that are shown on the map. So there's others up in Alaska? No, no, no. Uh, he was referring to the fact that that kind of distribution is not uncommon in other organisms. It's unusual to find something in Colorado and then on the other side of the globe and then really not much in between. Uh, you know, but it's not as uncommon as, as that. I, mean, I, I you know, there's probably 2% you know, of large genera have that distribution. Brief interlude of Mongolian music. Fiddles, 
and in lots of other aspects of their uh, culture. was big. How does it compare to ours? Bigger. But it wasn't the biggest. I guess I, I thought initially it was Apollo, which is even larger. But this is a good-sized butterfly. Uh, and it ranges uh, in Northeast Asia from the Urals to Korea. That is a little bit. Um, okay. Yeah, larvae of, of the Parnassian apparently feed on two kinds of stone crop, um, sedum and orostacus, orostacus? Yeah, it's a very low to the ground kind of stone crop thing. Orostacus is a stone crop. Yeah, it's, it's, you find it in birds sometimes, not commonly sometimes. Huh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And then dark green fritillary, again the range Palearctic from England to Iran to Japan. It uses several violets, so it's a pretty widespread. The lesser marble fritillary range from Spain to Siberia to Japan. Larvae feed on quite a range of plants, uh, many of which I'm not that familiar with, but a meadow sweet, um, drop wort, Same thing. Uh, stone bramble, which is a rubus, rubus uh, saxatillus, rubus, rubus. Uh, raspberry, aruncus, and spirea. Uh, and something called salad burnet, burnet, also a rose family plant. Yeah, uh, common weed right here. Uh, good. Goodbye. Okay, so down the road, just a little bit from the lunch spot, were these uh, this pond. It's our first white-naped cranes. A pair that were 
probably nesting there. And this large grizzled skipper. And uh, another ringlet, this one looking more like our satyrs than ringlets. But that's somebody's common name for it. Um, What's the flower? The one that the, the skipper is um, apparently nectaring on, I think that's a mint. It's uh, probably the stacky group than this. And the larvae for that skipper um, has been recorded on Agrimonia, Helianthium, Potentilla, Rubus, and Polygala. Go for it. Potentilla. Potentilla, yeah. Just down the road, a major mon or a, a smaller monastery, actually. A lot of the monasteries were eliminated or uh, torn down during the communist realm, but are being rebuilt and reoccupied. Um, and this was one of those. So this point right here, next stop is the uh, it's a wall, well, we're on our way to a wall, an archaeological site that folks don't know when it was built. But on our way there, we passed these, which you see often on the road in uh, Mongolia, called deer stones. And they're engraved stones um, from previous cultures. I think they're at least a couple thousand years old. But you also see places where roads come together, uh, high places, hills and whatnot cairns, which are called ovos. Uh, every word in Mongolia is spelled in English seems to be spelled a half a dozen different ways. But ovo is spelled O-B-O, O-V-O-O, O-V-O. It's all the same thing. And there's very strong connections between Mongolian spirituality and Tibetan. Um, Buddhism, animism, and the shamanism. So it's not uh, unexpected that you see these things look like prayer flags on the uh, on these ovos, and the woman in the center is offering a blessing of fermented horse milk. Uh, horse fermented horse milk is pretty important. Again, did you, know, you try it? Did did it's got a saying. It what? It's got a saying. It's pretty it's really pretty, pretty cool. Huh? I mean, you could, yeah, different people react to it differently. <laughs> that was okay. <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't like it. She didn't like it. Some of the birds on the step, because now we're out of the forested step and into the unforested step. <coughs> Golden Eagle. Um, these uh, damsel cranes, which were the more common cranes that we saw number of locations, often dancing, like these ones in the lower right, and a black vulture. The golden eagles, in some portions of Mongolia, um, particularly in the far west, among the Cossacks, are used for hunting. And they're reinstituting um, eagle festivals and with the trained eagles. But that's not the case here in central Mongolia. Again, areas that remind one a lot of um, Eastern Washington, Eastern Oregon, um, Montana. So here's that mysterious wall that goes all the way back to this, uh, this hill, pretty much circles this hill. Winter's not way up here. So we hiked back and in the process came across these butterflies. Again, uh, related to Fritillaria's um, checker spots in that group, this uh, particular, this Heath Fritillary, uh, the Napweed Fritillary, which I apologize for the blurry photograph, but we've run into that before uh, in Sicily, actually, some distance away, and this uh, Satyr, which was the largest, and had, of course, the floppy flight that you associate with. So those are checker spots, but Europeans don't know anything about our colony, so they call them fritillaries, right? I think they are checkers used. Yeah. 
They're confused, of course. <laughs> so what happens in the, in the, do they fly somewhere and then come back? Like, uh, like I, I don't know about these specifically, but I suspect that these are pretty much local. That they, like most of our uh, monarch behavior, is pretty unusual in the butterfly world. But um, I suspect these are pretty much grow up and go through their larval stages and their adult stages and pretty much locally. I want you to just tell me what you're at. Butterflies of the what? Oh. <laughs> you want me to try to pronounce that? Well, I'd rather <laughs> you than me. Oklachin Haram. Oh. Yeah. Who's the mark? Yeah, this has got some uh, commentary by the, by the folks in the vehicle. Oh my God, That's we're done! <laughs> There's a, boards uh, are not unusual here. Oh shit. Ooh, come on dinner, come on dinner. Come on dinner. Come on dinner. Can you get that? Yay! Oh shit. Oh what? <laughs> Russian-made cook vehicle. As soon as they stopped, their thing died and they couldn't get it started. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, about an hour later, it didn't get started. It just got wet. Yeah, it's true. It did get wet. <laughs> and this is what happens when vehicles sometimes get wet and they don't have bearing buddies. They get uh, where the bearings need to be repacked. But our drivers were completely with it. They had all the tools and everything they needed for whatever problem came up and here they are repacking the wheel bearings. And because we're stopped and this takes an hour or so, we got to explore around there. And this is a few of the things we found while the bearings were being repacked. The armory ground cricket. Pretty pretty potent looking critter. That's a female's old positive. Yeah, and 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 actually, it was very mellow. They're one of my favorite animals. The males get to call the females, and they get you know, all the benefits, right? You know, males call the females, and they get to choose which one. Really? Yeah. So a reverse. Uh, oh, our situation. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know why it needs such a long? Because <coughs> it has to be. I don't. If anybody can figure that out. What? What? Why it needs such a long overpositor? Oh, it has to get underneath. It has to go through some pretty tough soil. It has to, you know, lay its eggs pretty deep in the soil. Maybe because it's so dry? Yeah, or, right. Okay. Uh, Mormon crickets, crickets are you know, almost precisely the same, and they're in the same kinds of habitats. Oh, I didn't know that. And then the uh, bufo toad there. Mm -hmm. Did you like it? Uh, I didn't. It was, it was meditating. Bobbling, bobbling. <laughs> I, I, it looked to me like it was saying, I'm cool, but I best not push it. Leave <laughs> <laughs> me alone. Is it poisonous? Is that what you're trying to say? I think that, that may be what Jonathan is hinting at. What? The poison. Poisonous? Of, of well, looking one up. man's poison is another man's intoxication. <laughs> oh. oh. Oh, I don't know any I've heard about it. Okay. <laughs> Next time. And a black kite. So, wherever we traveled, if there were one kind of problem or another, we were now stuck in a marsh. The, the diesel, obviously, blowing black smoke. That's not black smoke, that's mud. Well, it's also, yeah, it's mud mixed with black smoke. <laughs> Well, no, yeah, I mean, the thing is, that if, as long as
long as you keep moving, you won't get stuck. It's it's true in the way that it's true that it's not the fall that kills you; it's the sudden stop at the bottom that does. As long as you keep moving, yeah, you're not stuck. But, but, you stop <laughs> Am I right? I kind of like that. I had looked at it though. <laughs> Yeah, and our drivers varied in their ability. To, we have one very wise older driver who was always the last one to go through and always made it through. But the young Turks, um, it was particularly one of them who managed to get himself stuck on it early. I presume that's him there, right? I think that may have been. <laughs> <laughs> so so here, here we've got it being too wet. Here we've got it being too dry. This is a camping spot that we were going to that was we had pond that had cranes, uh, but it had dried up, and it was a you know, classic cow skull there. Um, but it was a theme that we ran into everywhere. Uh, we talked to people, it was like either very dry year or very wet year, depending on where they were, mostly very dry. Next stop, a nature reserve uh, on the Merlin River. And uh, as an example, here it was considered quite dry, and they uh, operated the nature reserve in such a way that the herders, in drought conditions, could bring some of their animals into the nature reserve. How does it get light from there? Um, there's, a, there's a hole in the top of, of the gear. And actually, it's interesting. So as the sun rises and sets, the light from that hole travels around the inside of the gear. And that's the way you are to walk. There's only one way you are to walk in the gear. You come in, go to the left, and go counterclockwise. And that's the way the sun moves. And they're always set up so that they're facing north. And are they in communities, or are they how far to the next community? It depends, but a lot of them are out on their lonesome. And, and of course they can move them, which is the reason they have them, because the herds need to be moved from um, season to season. So they can pack these up, roll them up, put them on a cart. And in the old times, they would haul them with oxen on the cart to a new location. Now lots of times they'll have a pickup or a flatbed or something. Well, the Great Khan lived like this. Yes. Um, and they had large ones that were, I think, born, uh, that were elevated and could be moved all the time. They were set up um, semi-permanently and, and location to location. What season were you there? Was this in spring? This was July. So most, we were there for three weeks in July. It looks surprisingly green, at least in that photo. Yeah, again, some, some areas it had rain recently, others hadn't, and it just depended. What's that? Oh, that's right, okay, Jeanette's reminding me that July is the season of rain there. 
Yes. Were they bringing the cattle, the animals in each evening to avoid predation? You know, I'm not sure, but that could be. They, most of the places have dogs, and the dogs are historically there to protect against wolves. Um, but in a lot of areas, the wolves seem to have been, uh, populations are way down, because they're hunted. Even though wolves are on there's a sort of weird dichotomy. Uh, they may well be bringing them in, in some cases, to milk them, um, that sort of thing. It's just some really interesting uh, discussions and books about how the Mongolians treat their herd animals. And it's pretty interesting that there's, there are no fences virtually no fences. So they're free to travel. The horses uh, are pretty much handled like uh, the wild horses would be, with a single stallion and a group of mares. Uh, so it's a different way of handling the animals than, than we have. Anyway, moving right along, get to the south. The steps flatten. We, uh, this is an area also a preserve but very heavily grazed and we aren't seeing many butterflies in these areas. Uh, the uh, wildflowers, to the extent there are wildflowers, are very low and uh, a lot of just grazed to the ground and if you get out of the car you smell onions but that's largely what you're seeing. What are those big white things down there? All those are uh, sheep and goats. We call them rain bags. <laughs> Here they are on the move. So, further to the south, Mongolia, uh, Mongolian gazelles uh, travel 35 to 45 miles per hour. Wolves are there, we hunt them. And this toad headed agama off to the right. It's, uh, interesting behavior. Apparently, when it rains, it will squat down on its front legs and raise its hind legs. And the water will run down its back and into its mouth. <laughs> so, speaking of rain, um, so it's been very dry. Now we get into the Gobi and it's flooding. Place called Seventy Springs. Mm. And welcome to the Gobi Desert. <laughs> People are not going to believe. You're, uh, Came from eggs. 
there's dinosaur eggs mm -hmm. here. Uh -huh. And this is an area where we would not have expected to find any butterflies, but there were two. Two butterflies doing their spiral dance over the flaming cliffs. I tried for a while, I didn't have the speed and agility, but we came to the nets of our drivers, and they had the speed and agility, and we will hear Captain. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's something not like not a painted lady. Okay. Yeah. 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 I see the painted lady. I know. Come on, you got it. Excellent. Wow. Ooh. Second one. Oh, yay. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> so we got both of them. And it's driver, one driver, knowledgeable driver, and fast driver. We're uh, able to catch both of them. Oh, here they are. Wow. Um, Amazing. And this is the one on the right, the butterfly that we still have. So we have here in the U.S. painted lady. I'm not sure about that. No, you got the right. That's what it is. Oh, well, yeah, the one on the right. The one on the left. No, you got the one on the left. Right. Right. Do I? All right. So two different species spiraling together in the flaming cliffs. I uh, just. Wow. My thought. You're going to write a poem like that. We can do that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so as the sunset, it's not quite the last slide, but we're close. Um, we had vodka there, we had a fair amount of vodka there, and boiled meat. It was, it was pretty cool. Wait, wait, vodka and boiled meat? Separately. Oh. <laughs> we did not boil the meat in the vodka. But that's <laughs> one of our stuff. Second to the last stop here, on Garnell's uh, sand dunes that are a thousand meters high. And uh, camel ride. And there's another video here, probably hard to see, but here are the camels down here moving between these ponds, the water, the rain uh, soaks into the dunes and then leaks out the skirts, the bottom, and into these ponds, which is where Camel herders were keeping the camels. So back up north, heading back north now. And uh, this is sort of what it was like traveling along over the steppe. There's all these braided roads everywhere, and sometimes a fairly high rate of speed, and sometimes what happens is when you're. So we stopped. Here to repair the shock absorber and located an another butterfly, common blue, uh, Polymatis icarus, and a black stork, which is very common and uh, not often spotted. So the breakdowns had their distinct value. And pretty much our last stop here, this is the old capital of Mongolia, Karakoram, from the time of the Khans the early cons, and the largest monastery, the monks there with their cell phones and <laughs> prayer wheels. Uh, a, an oboe here, people bring their skulls from their favorite horses up um, to the oboes, hoping that they'll be reincarnated. At least that's the version we heard. Uh -huh. And that's the end of the the button.